You're listening to Nutrition Matters Podcast with Paige Smathers, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist. Hey everyone, it's Paige, your favorite nutrition podcaster and dietitian. Nutrition Matters Podcast explores what really matters in nutrition and health with a sensitive and realistic approach. This podcast relies on the support of listeners like you and needs donations to keep this project running. To help support the podcast, please consider making a donation at pagesmathersrd.com slash podcast. If you find this episode interesting, engaging, or helpful in your life, please consider donating, sharing with friends and family, and leaving a review on iTunes. You can leave a review about this podcast straight from your podcast app, search Nutrition Matters Podcast, click reviews, and then write a review. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook at Paige Smathers RD if you'd like to have a little more food for thought. Thank you for listening. Welcome to Nutrition Matters Podcast. I'm Paige, your host, and I'm always excited to share these episodes with you all. But today I'm just really, really super excited because this topic is so important and my guests are so wise and brilliant and I just was amazed by what we what we talked about and I learned so much. So I had the pleasure of interviewing Lexi and Lindsay Kite of Beauty Redefined and we actually recorded in my office in Salt Lake City which was so fun. We got to hang out and chat a bit before we started and get to know each other and it was just so much fun. So just a few items of housekeeping. Um, we're getting closer and closer to the mindful eating workshop that I'm putting on with Noah Rochetta, the host of the Secular Buddhism podcast. Uh, we're doing this in Salt Lake City on April 7th, which is a Saturday. Uh, we have all kinds of awesome donors that have donated stuff for our little goodie bags that we're giving away to everybody who comes. Harmon's donated. Um, we have a local yoga studio that donated. Um, Pro Bar Kodiak Cakes is actually coming and sponsoring the breakfast. There's all kinds of fun stuff that's going to be happening. It's going to be a day that you're going to walk away with really feeling like you have practical knowledge in how to approach food and your body in a healthy way um, with this kind of mindfulness perspective. So I can't wait to have you there. And if you're interested in checking it out, um, it's mindfuleatingworkshop.com. It's the website where you can find out more and sign up. And don't forget to use the code Nutrition Matters at checkout to save $50. Okay, so that's the Mindful Eating Workshop. And then I always like to just promote what I'm up to. And some of you might have noticed that I am actually rebranding my entire website. Um, it's been quite the, quite the process. And um, I am hiring another dietitian to work with me at my Salt Lake um, location. So lots of new things going on. My my new business is called Positive Nutrition, and the new website is positive-nutrition.com. So for from now on, if you want to access podcast episodes or blog posts, or if you want to check out my services or course or anything like that, you'll head over to positive-nutrition.com. And I am trying to secure the positivenutrition.com domain, but I'm having a hard time communicating with the owner who lives in Italy. So if any of you speak Italian and want to help uh, tr- help me try to secure that domain that would be <laughs> that would be amazing but for now it's positive-nutrition.com and thank you so much for being a part of this journey for me thanks for your patience in all the ways that I am imperfect thank you for growing and learning and evolving with me this project is so so fun and I love knowing that it's affecting people and uh, having a positive, impact in your life. So thanks for being around and enjoy this this episode with Lindsay and Lexi Kite. It is seriously one of my faves so far. So enjoy. Lindsay and Lexi Kite, welcome to Nutrition Matters Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so Lindsay and Lexi Kite are both um, body image experts and they're coming on the podcast to talk about their research, as well as all kinds of other topics. So just take a minute and introduce yourselves kind of individually and talk about um, who you are and what you do. 
Sounds good. I'm Lindsay Kite. Uh, we're identical twins, so it's kind of hard to introduce ourselves individually. We do this work together. We are co-directors of the nonprofit Beauty Redefined. Um, it's based in Salt Lake City, and we travel pretty regularly to talk to people about our expertise in body image resilience because we have PhDs studying it. Um, we got our PhDs from the University of Utah in 2013. Wow, that seems crazy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we studied the effects of media on women's perceptions of their bodies and their health. And we identified body image resilience as this important pathway out of this objectifying culture and the feelings that can arise from that. And uh, Lexi, <laughs> you talk to us. <laughs> and I'm Lexi Kite. Um, Lindsay shared a lot of what we are at Beauty Redefined. On the side, I can tell about who we are. I have a, a very cute, sweet husband and a very cute, sweet baby um, named Logan, my little baby girl. And um, Lindsay and I both live in Salt Lake, in basically downtown Salt Lake. And Beauty Redefined is definitely a passion project for us. It's something that um, we both conceived of during our master's research and have been doing it since 2009. So almost 10 years. It's our nine-year anniversary of Beauty Redefined. And we do most of our work online through online activism on social media. We have an online program and we do lots of live speaking events, which is our favorite part. Okay, so I feel like the listeners are going to be wondering if you did all of your schooling together the whole time. Huh. Tell us about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we tried so hard not to. <laughs> yeah, it's, we should talk more about the twin stuff. Mm -hmm. But we tried really hard to be different for most of our lives. Um, even through our undergraduate degrees, I studied journalism and women's studies, and Lexi did journalism and speech communication, so very similar and some overlap there. But then we didn't even tell each other where we were applying to grad school. At that point, we weren't that great of friends. We didn't talk to each other very much. It's so weird. But uh, we both ended up applying to the University of Utah, and we got matching fellowships to come to the U and work together. And we stayed there through for six years for our master's and PhDs. And yes, we took every single class together. <laughs> That is hilarious for not being good friends at the time. I know. It was totally nuts. Honestly, Beauty Redefined has brought us together as twins in a way that nothing else could have. It's true. We used our competitive nature for good for Beauty Redefined. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Probably where? for the first time ever, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, if you want to talk about the twin stuff, like <laughs> we lived a life as identical twins looking very similar to each other where the way people would tell us apart was through the minute details that were different about us. So my teeth are a tiny bit more crooked than Lindsay's. <laughs> and I she have, has a hard time saying that even now. <laughs> they are a tiny bit more crooked. They are largely straight. The so when are everybody straight. is like picking out your differences mm -hmm. all the time and pointing them out, I can see how that would, like not oh, yeah. only are you more competitive as twins, but then when people are trying to differentiate you, like literally differentiate you oh, yeah, exactly. and figuratively. Every person you meet is scanning you and scrutinizing you and doing it so obviously. You know, it's just a normal thing where you meet someone and they say, oh, so how do people tell you apart? And then they look you up and down and they look at your face really closely yeah, they and say, they would pick out crazy oh, things. Oh, Lexi has a mole on her nose. It's a freckle. So I was Frexy Lexi. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So I can only imagine how hard that would make like the awkward teen age body image oh. years for you guys. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It was weird. We were so competitive about everything. So not only were we competitive about who was the fastest swimmer and who was the best speller and who got the best grades, but it was also like who can burn the most calories in a in a week mm -hmm. or in a workout and um, who can lose the most weight or eat the fewest number of carbs. Like we oh, really yeah. battled each other to see who could be the most excessive about things okay. like that. And you guys, this is fun because I hardly ever do in-person interviews, but we're sitting here together in my office in Salt Lake and I'm looking at you both and <clears throat> you look different to me is it just me or is it now you've like grown grown up and kind of developed your own you look? know it is definitely all based on individual perception really yeah. yes <clears throat> it is so different for every person a lot of people will see us and even whisper as they walk past us twins <laughs> They'll get, people get really excited in stores we were just walking out of work at the U so we work together full time up at the University of Utah. You both work together. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yes. We are a two woman team. We run development for the College of, of Humanities. Yeah. It's crazy. 
it's weird. But we were walking out of work the other day to go to a meeting, and this guy stopped us that we had never seen before, and he said, you know, you don't see adult twins every day. This is actually pretty exciting for me. <laughs> oh, good. I'm so glad I could brighten up your day. So he recognized immediately that we were identical and pulled someone else over to see, look at these two. They look exactly the same. But then other people look at us like you and say, like, yeah. I can maybe tell your sisters, but yeah. mm-hmm. my husband doesn't think we look anything alike, you know? know? Like... You never know. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. that's funny. It's mm-hmm. weird. <laughs> so talk about how how this work got started for you guys of, of working on body image. So when we were, we were both 18, we were in a freshman classroom that was required for all journalists. It was on media literacy, the ability to read and understand why media looks the way it does. Why are women presented the way they are in media? We also talked about race and violence. Lindsay and I were taking different sections of the same class so we wouldn't have to sit in the classroom together. That was when we were trying desperately to not do the same thing. So I went to my class I sat in that classroom on the very first day while the professor just introduced us to the topic of the fact that media is largely profit-driven and women are presented to us in media looking a very certain way because that drives billions of dollars in sales every year and causes women to fixate on their looks and be self-conscious. When I heard that, my heart pounded faster. I got goosebumps. I felt like crying. I felt truth. I felt it. I knew that what I was hearing was true and that I had been impacted by these these thoughts and feelings. You know, I was I was class president every year of high school. Lindsay and I were competitive swimmers. We were by all accounts from the outside successful and doing great and happy. But I had spent years of my life with food journals, counting what I was eating every day, Um, having these exercise competitions with Lindsay from the time we were just little about how many hours a day we could work out, how many carbs we were eating, you know, the works. I went home to my dorm room and I told Lindsay about this class and she said, uh, I took the same class. It was a very twin-like experience. The dorm room we shared, by the way, it was like (laughs) 10 square feet and we had to live together, which I think is why we didn't talk to each other for a few years after (laughs) that. I could see that being hard. It was brutal. But yeah, I had the exact same experience. I remember sitting in that class and just seeing, um, magazine covers. They were showing um, magazine covers that featured women and and showing us the difference between how men are portrayed and represented in media. And for the first time, I saw objectification for what it was, how women are literally presented and displayed as objects to be looked at mostly for how they appear to others. And that, um, that opened my eyes to the point where I, you know, you can't unsee it after you learn to see it. And it sounds so simple, but it really did. It paved a path for us to move forward with that as a lens. Um, so that I went and double majored in women's studies and journalism. And we both decided to go to graduate school to look into the back end of how and why messages are engineered the way they are and how women can learn to recognize that and reject it. Okay. So to me, there's so much that's amazing about that story. The thing that I love the most is that your whole life you're like fighting against each other mm-hmm. and kind of competitive and not in the best relationship with each other. And then it wasn't until you finally decided to like come together and each use your own strengths, like where yeah. you've developed this amazing body of research along with a course, along with um, an organization and so many resources for people to get to, to heal, you know, and it's so cool. It's like, oh, it only worked as soon as you could just like be friends and work together. It's yeah. true. Yeah. We fighting would completely tear us apart. This, mm-hmm. it really has been a way for us to pool our common interests into something that is no longer who can be the best body image researcher, who can do the, the mm-hmm. most good for people. It, it benefits us to both be as good as we possibly can be. Yeah, like we've really found this mission that is ours. We, I finally feel like over the last several years that Lindsay and I are twins on purpose, you know? Like mm. we say that about the pain people go through in their lives. Our work in body image resilience brings to light that we need to shine a light on the pain we experience and not just kind of dissolve it back into our very uncomfortable comfort comfort zones, but instead shine a light on it, call it out, become stronger, not just in spite of the pain, but because of the pain. And for Lindsay and I, I think that Beauty Redefined might be more powerful because we've come together. You know, it, we wouldn't even have Beauty Redefined if it was just one of us, probably. Do you yeah, think? I can't imagine. It's so okay, so <laughs> are you guys, <clears throat> oh my gosh, my voice, are you guys good at different things? Like, are you 
one person kind of does more of this end, one person does another, or do you both work together on pretty much all of it? We work together on all of it, except <clears throat> Lindsay does our graphic design work. And I am not a graphic designer, so I kind of hate that you said that. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm a little more picky visually about things, I think, and so I take over that part of it. But we both, I think, we we specialized in different things during yeah. our doctoral research, and so that means obviously we both have learned from each other's research and consider mm -hmm. ourselves experts on all of the different areas that encompass our work. But I specifically focused in physical health and the ways physical health is defined and represented and even measured in media um, and in our cultural discourse about bodies. And so a lot of my research focused on how people define it and measure it for themselves and whether they feel that it's attainable and how to make it attainable for people. And Lexi's focused a lot on self-objectification. So both of these are a huge focus of our work. But but our, so our dissertations are two separate things, but very complementary. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to have this much wider breadth of research mm -hmm. because our work is complementary and we could specialize in different areas that need to go together, but wouldn't necessarily have been possible one, for one. Yeah, one. one brain might not be able to have yeah. done all of that. Hmm. Yeah, I, think so. I haven't thought about it like that, but that makes me feel a lot better about what we do. <laughs> like, uh -huh. It's twice as much. <laughs> yeah, but kind of all unified yeah, in one thing. Sure. So I I want to I have so many things I want to talk to you about. One of them is this concept of feminism. Um, we live in a conservative place. Um, for those of you listening who don't know Utah, that's where we are. <laughs> and sometimes I've noticed sometimes when people hear the word feminism, they're either really excited by it or like really really repelled by it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have a lot of I I identify as a feminist. But I have a lot of interesting observations when I run in feminist circles, kind of hearing people just kind of chatter about life or about motherhood or about feminist issues. I really see a lack of discourse around the idea of bodies and food and, and self-care and how we, how we see our bodies. I mean, I just think it's like, it's this disconnect. We're like, yeah, we're feminists, but we're totally dieting and like, we hate our bodies. And I, I just, I don't. I don't get that. So for anyone listening, let's talk about your conception of the, of the concept of feminism and also how beauty and body image are really feminist issues. Yeah, that's a big question, but it's one that we feel very strongly about and it comes up a lot in our social media work. Um, feminism to us is something that's really important specifically because women grow up with a set of experiences that from the outside defines women largely um, our culture defines women according to their appearance. And feminism teaches women to recognize these oppressive structures, including things like objectification and patriarchy, where men make the decisions and women cater to men and, and women are valued according to what men see, what men like, um, even paid according to some really oppressive structures. And feminism allows women to, um, or allows all people, to prioritize women's perspective on things that women have often been left out of or ignored. And so we're very much um, in... The, we're looking through the lens of equality for men and women. We want women to have the same opportunities and resources available to them legally, professionally, economically, culturally in every way. And we very much consider ourselves advocates for women. That is, that is center of our work. We love and care about women. And our eyes have really been opened through 10 years of college and five years since then so, and that's not that long for some people that are older and listening to this, but for 15 years, our eyes have been open to the ways in which beauty and bodies has kept women fixated on their bodies as objects to be looked at, to be judged, to be fixed, to be consumed, to be tossed aside. And when women are, are portrayed and believe themselves to be valuable most as bodies instead of thinking, feeling humans, my goodness, women falter. When we are fixated on our looks at the expense of our lives, can you imagine how the world is is missing out on women? I've thought about that so much. Like, what could womankind accomplish if we even spent half as much time fixating on these things? Oh, like, yeah, we, exactly. there's so much energy and time put into these things that don't matter and actually make us less healthy and less 
vibrant and less engaged and less happy. Yes. And this is why this is a feminist issue is because yeah. it's it's holding women back it from is, seeing exactly. who they could be without it. Yeah. To respond to that second part of your question, Paige, about how um, sometimes that conversation is missing from feminist discussions, I absolutely agree. Um, there's there's a whole wave, or a, not necessarily a, a literal wave of feminism, but like a, a there's a side of it that scholars call post-feminism or commodified feminism. And it's this idea that the job of feminism is done. Women have the right to vote. We now have all equal opportunities with men. Um, women can choose to be mothers. They can choose to be in the workforce and they can have it all. And this idea uh, is really um, limited and short-sighted and it doesn't recognize all the ways that women really are still oppressed and still held back. And one of those big ways that's left out of the conversation is this objectification that we've been talking about. Um, this was a conversation that was first brought up in the 90s with the book uh, The Beauty Myth by Naomi Wolf. And it's one of those books that was really transformational for me and a lot of other people in this feminism space um, talk about it being a turning point for them because it discusses the idea of um, beauty being the it's the beauty myth because it's it's something that's unreachable. It's perpetually out of range for most people because the bar for beauty is consistently being moved out of reach. It is um, it's based on thinness, extreme thinness. It's based on um, surgical augmented parts that change every year based on the and trends. Photoshop. And Photoshop. I've heard Photoshop, models digital. talk about how they wish they looked the way they exactly. do. Exactly. Of course. It's yeah. true. Pictures. Our yeah. ideals the are The way so they look. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Own they want to look like they yeah. do on magazine covers. And so that's something that is a huge part of what's holding women back. When we get focused on our appearance or think that we can only be happy or valued or loved when we look a certain way and it's based on an ideal that's out of reach, then we're all falling short and we always will be and we'll continue to hold ourselves back. And that's missing from a lot of feminist conversations um, in kind of a scary way because a lot of the discussions we see online around especially empowerment and even body positivity are based on this idea that my body looks good and if your body looks like mine you should feel good too and maybe they don't literally say those words but what they're doing by sharing photos of their bodies and sharing photos of other women's undressed bodies with the words empowered written on them I'm referring to the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue that has just come out um, this is a, a pretty fake, fleeting idea of what constitutes empowerment that's still based on an objectifying system that awards women points for looking um, or being able to be visually consumed or physically consumed by men, by women, by whoever. When it's in Sports Illustrated, men are the target audience, but all people are viewing it and seeing that as what supposedly constitutes feeling empowered and loving your body. It's kind of like, okay, your body doesn't look like the traditional model, but that's okay because this body's hot. Uh -huh. And, and I, I can just, I mean, I'm totally on board with what you're saying, and I totally agree, but I always like to anticipate what someone listening might be thinking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can you can come up with the, the, the typical kind of like, but wait, like, isn't it good for women to be, to think their bodies are beautiful? And isn't it good to show diverse body size? Um, and, and so what, what do you say when people come at you with that? Because I'm sure they do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is somewhere uh, we've made a niche for ourselves online. We're speaking about this in a way that nobody else is. Lindsay did a TED Talk for Beauty Redefined on this. Which is going to be linked on this oh, episode, good. and everybody should listen. Okay, thank you. That's like a really good intro to what we believe. What we're saying here is that when women are presented as bodies first and people second, regardless of the size of their body, if they are presenting themselves as bodies and saying my body looks good too. Look at my body. Validation for my body. We are still keeping the shallow focus on women as bodies. Yeah, our, the whole premise of our work is to move beyond that. So redefine the meaning and value of beauty, not just the look of beauty, because we recognize that the root of the problem here, the reason why women are wanting to see bodies that look different and sharing photos and, and liking and commenting about bodies who look different than the traditional ideals we've been sold, is because we have all been sold this lie that women are bodies first and foremost, that our appearance is the most important thing about us. And in order to so the root of that really is um, not only shame about your appearance, but feeling defined by your body. Mm -hmm. And from our perspective, the root of this problem isn't just shame about your appearance, it's self-objectification, which is... And I want to get into that, but I also oh, want to sure. say one thing. 
So one of the big complaints I hear in session with clients about body positivity is that it feels so unattainable because they see some of these pictures and these women saying, look at me, I love my body, Um, which we all know realistically, like we're going to have days where we don't feel that way. No matter how positive Mm -hmm. we feel about our body, we're going to have a day where we're like, oh, this is hard to feel that way. Um, And so what I think is, I think that that this is great, that, that there are diverse bodies being shown. I think that that's like a good step for women to be able to see that and be exposed to that and like appreciate beauty in that. Um, but I, one of my critiques of that approach is that it does kind of set you up for like body positivity being this like ideal to get to. Like if I'm, I'm just going to stay where I am because I can't feel oh, yeah. perfectly positive about my body. So I'm just, I can't do the whole body positivity yeah, thing. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it just feels so unattainable and like discouraging mm-hmm. and shameful, even though it's about something positive, which is like, no, that's Absolutely. not the point. Yeah. I have two responses to that. The first is, and this is responding to your other question too, about like, well, isn't it good to see more diverse bodies? Yes, it's good to see more diverse bodies. That's fine, but it is a first step. The internet is now saturated with every type of body you could ever want to see, every type of woman's body. We do not ask men to prove their confidence and their self-worth by taking off their clothes and posting a photo of themselves online. That is what we ask women to do because women are taught that our bodies are the most valuable thing about us. So men are not saying, look, I'm showing you all that I love myself because this is my body. But somehow women think that's what we're supposed to do. Lindsay and I probably have that body type, that body positive (laughs) body type that is all, we have it, that is all over online. Like it's that it's a little thicker, you know, but it's still hourglass. Uh, I would never take off my clothes and post it on Beauty Redefined as a way to help other people feel better about themselves. Because I want those people to know that your body is great, whatever it is, and you don't have to love it and embrace it. You can just feel neutral about it. Your right. body is an instrument, not an ornament. Mm-hmm. And that's your whole point. Yes. Yeah. It's like, it's taking it beyond this, like, oh, I'm beautiful the way I am, which oh, yeah. is great. No yeah. one's arguing that you shouldn't think that way. Right. And that can be really helpful on an individual level to kind of start to appreciate your body for what it is. But your point is, let's take it a step further and really question why do we yes. need to feel beautiful? Yeah. Yes. First of all, yeah. right? <laughs> Feeling okay yeah. about your appearance or even good about your appearance is one aspect of feeling good about yourself. And unfortunately, body positivity has become this thing that's about beauty. It's not about accepting and loving and respecting your body. It's about loving and accepting and respecting the way your body looks. We feel like that is a huge mistake. Yes. Huge mistake. It's so short-sighted and it's also pretty sexist. Like Lexi was saying, we don't ask men to prove their body confidence by showing pictures of their bodies on the internet. When we're talking about body confidence, we want people to, this is one of our little phrases that we use, positive body image isn't feeling like your body looks good. It's knowing your body is good. I love that. Yeah. I think it's so that's important. so, that's such a simple way to describe what you're trying right. to say. Yeah. Is your body good? It can be good regardless of what it looks like. And you can feel grateful for it. You can yeah. be neutral toward it. You yes. can feel positively. You can have a bad day with it. You of can, course. you know, and I loved one of my guests on my podcast said, the way she views body positivity is she spends a little less time in the negative space and a little bit more time in the positive. Mm, and I think, nice. I think that that's a good way to view it because I have so many people say like this whole body positivity thing. I just, it's just not for me. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, no one's just walking around thinking like, gosh, I am awesome all day, every day. Mm-hmm. Like, and the, if they are like, okay, that's a little, it's a little <laughs> great. Uh-huh. Good for you. Like, I mean, we all have those days, you yeah. know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing, uh, can we talk a bit about self-objectification? Yes, that's actually where I wanted to go next. Yeah. So so you guys, you, Lexi, mm-hmm. did your dissertation on this idea of self-objectification. And I heard you talk about this, and I've seen it online, but for some reason, like, I heard you talk about it, and it totally clicked what it really meant. Good. And I've thought about it myself. I've talked to some clients about it. And it's a really powerful concept. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of, just to put it in, into context of what we've already said, this is kind of this idea of taking body positivity from your body looks good to your body is good. This is how you do this, mm-hmm. yeah. right? This is kind of yeah. like how to view that process. Yeah, that's a good way of okay. putting it. Mm-hmm. So most girls and women today, studies show us, 
are picturing themselves living instead of just living. It's called self-objectification. And what it means is we grow up in a world that from every angle, from the ways we talk about each other and each other's bodies to what we're viewing in media, is it's objectification, the root word here being object. We are seeing women and ourselves presented to ourselves as, as parts from the roots in our hair to our scratchy feet and every inch of us in between. It's been co-opted by industries that want us to believe that our bodies are the most important thing about us. And so we grow up living and picturing ourselves living. So I always give an example to help people kind of put this into their own lives. Let's say you are, are walking across the street on a beautiful day and instead of thinking about um, watching out for the cars or I need to call my dad because I haven't talked to him in a while or your to-do list, you've got this mental task list in your head that says you need to adjust your skirt because it's riding up and people can probably see the cellulite on your legs or you really should have washed your hair today. It is so greasy. I bet the person behind you in line at the store was looking at how greasy your gross hair was. The list goes on. You've got this mental task list in your head. In your head. When I first learned about self-objectification in my, in my dissertation research, a light bulb went off in my head that said, Oh my goodness, can you imagine how women and girls are being held back because of this? And research, research brings this to light. Research tells us that girls and women who are in a state of self-consciousness, of self-objectification, which is most girls and women throughout their lives, they perform worse on math tests, on reading comprehension tests. They can't throw a softball as far. They can't lift as heavy of weights when they're in front of a mirror because they are conscious of their bodies and it gets in the middle of their flow state of being able to just do and flow. I see it in my own life. Uh, Lindsay sees it in her life. Self-objectification is a part of every girl and woman's journey. But once we know about it, we can shine that light on it and fight back against it. When we realize our bodies don't have to be at the forefront of our thoughts at all times, we can start viewing our bodies as instruments instead of objects. And where you're not here to be looked at, right? Oh, when yeah. you see that that's not your purpose on this earth. And so when you're doing that to yourself, I kind of conceptualize it like you're kind of hovering over your body, yes. watching your body exist and move throughout the world and you're 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 nitpicking oh like you described this um the other day you were saying when you're running on the treadmill and I totally have these thoughts I can't lie like mm -hmm. where you're like ah my fat is spilling over the sides yep. of, of my pants and oh do I have cellulite in these yep. and what are people seeing behind me and do I have a wedgie and like all this mm -hmm. stuff like I totally I totally do that got to admit but yep. then but then you saying that helped me see like oh that's self-object objectification yeah and I don't want to exist in that world I want to like right. be in my body and like doing things instead exactly. of mm -hmm. thinking about that, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Recognizing it. That sounds so cliche to say that like acknowledgement is the first step out or, you know, <laughs> awareness is key. And it really is because self-objectification is this thing that most girls and women grow up doing all the time. Where does it start? Uh, but at age, yeah. Do, do mo I mean, okay. So I feel like we culturally in different, I mean, different cultures might do this more than others, right? Like I'm imagining my upbringing. I remember, you know, coming out in some like cute dress that I thought was totally fine. And, and I remember my parents being like, Oh, that's like so terrible. Why would you ever wear that out? People are going to oh, think yeah. this and like conservative cultures will do yeah. it worse than others. <laughs> it's true. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like it's, it's, it's how we're raised. It's yeah. how it's the, the marketing and the advertisements we see. Mm -hmm. It's how we see people connect on TV shows and, and the beautiful woman with the beautiful parts mm -hmm. that are objectified gets mm -hmm. the whatever prize at the yeah. end, you know? Um, and I have two little girls ages three and five and I don't, I don't see this at all with them so far. And I'm like, it's such a beautiful thing to see a little one just I be free with their bodies and not have any idea of any of this. Yeah. It's so inspiring. Oh, it's amazing. And but. that, that I think is so hopeful because mm -hmm. like Lexi said, conservative cultures definitely play a role in this. There's one factor where, um, of course it's how you talk to girls and it can differ from family to family, no matter what kind of cultural environment you're in. If you're focused on the way a girl looks and you're valuing that and talking consistently about her appearance more than you would talk to a boy about his appearance, oh, yeah. then that's a real sign. That's a big one. And yeah. that's something that's, I'm so 
grateful for, but people are talking about that. Yes. You know, they're saying, Hey, when you see a little girl, try to think of something other than your hair is really cute and or yes. yeah. Like, mm-hmm. why don't you say, what books are you reading? Yes. What are you interested in? How's school going? And you know, we don't need to get too weird about it where we can't ever say anything like, like, Oh, I really like that dress, but, yeah, but, but we want to think it. of yeah. other things too, because it really is fascinating when you look at yourself and you see yourself interacting with a young boy versus a young girl, there's just a natural socialized difference yeah. we do, don't you think? Right, oh, and yeah. if it is a huge difference, I think we all need to really take a step back and analyze why we're doing that and, and see how the objectification of our culture and prioritizing looks on girls has seeped into the way we view other people, including beautiful little children, you know? Yeah. That's one of those steps that's going to... P- parents are going to start to recognize that. And it has been a conversation for a few years, thank goodness. Um, but it also helps to to grow up in an environment, uh, a family, let alone a culture, where women are being valued for more. So if, they, if we can have women in leadership positions, have women... Um, leading in any type of a capacity, whether it's um, being on boards or uh, even leading a classroom as teachers, yeah, as like principals. Yeah, hearing them yeah. instead of just seeing them on the sidelines. Right. Hearing women, seeing women talk, um, acknowledging women's contributions in families, in communities, in churches, in the world, then all kids, including little girls, will grow up and see that there's more to strive for than just making sure other people see that you look beautiful. Mm-hmm. And that's been a problem in conservative environments culturally because in some of the places where we all share our experiences, especially at churches and things like that and in, in community environments where it's all men all the time who are in charge and making the decisions and doing the speaking, then little girls grow up not knowing that they can aspire to be able to lead and make an impact in a community, even within their own homes if, the, if they see their moms you know, playing kind of a behind-the-scenes role or not getting much acknowledgement, things like that. If we can value women and learn to to recognize that women have the ability to lead and contribute to the world in ways that have nothing to do with what they look like, then we're going to make huge strides forward for girls. Amen. Amen to that. (laughs) So I love some of the stuff that you've put out there about dress codes. Mm -hmm. Um, Just a couple weeks ago or days ago, maybe you, you posted this thing that was like this tiny little teensy line about like boys are required to wear X thing. And then it was like this gigantic paragraph of like all the rules about like nitpicking what a girl can wear. Now this, this is a tricky conversation, but I think we should go there because I think it's really fascinating to really, to highlight your ideas about objectification and how that plays out and how we very earnestly and with good intentions parent our children, but, but also maybe talk about what that communicates to our girls and boys about gender roles and about what, you know, what women are for Mm -hmm. in terms of like to be looked at or to to keep them, to keep boys safe if they dress a certain way. Yeah. Oh, we could talk about this all day long. So that image we posted, it was a dress code for a church prom. So um, it happened here in Salt Lake City, which is a thriving city that isn't just purely Mormons that are dressed head to toe in, you know, very <laughs> modest. It's not the sister wives thing it's you not. see on TV. <laughs> it's not. Sister okay. Wives. Yeah. I feel like we need to say that. Cause yeah. we're like, I traveled to Hawaii a few years ago and I was like, showed them my license to get into a national park. And they were like, you're from Utah. Are you a polygamist? And I was like, um, oh. that is so offensive. Can you please, I mean, not that it's quite anyway. a stereotype and yeah, I mean, we should just be upfront that uh, we don't fit that stereotype. Most people are no. in and Salt Lake City. Salt Lake is it's a very an amazing, diverse. cool yeah. place. Super, like, amazing art. Amazing, like, oh, yeah. cultural, it's thriving great. place. So um, don't yeah. don't judge us too much, listeners no, who aren't from here. No, but people <laughs> deal with dress codes all over the place. Yeah. Basically, this was a flyer that we saw for this church prom that had one line. Boys, please wear a shirt and tie and make sure your pants are pulled up. And girls had, like a hundred lines about all of the things that needed to be covered on them. The inches that could not be showing, the inches that could be showing. These girls were literally, by very well-meaning people, objectified into every inch of their body. They were broken down into parts. And what we see when we see dress codes like this that disproportionately affect girls is a well-meaning attitude that becomes incredibly dangerous for those girls and for the boys looking at those girls. So basically what we're seeing is a culture that is trying to protect the, the 
vision of boys and men who could have maybe dangerous or sinful thoughts about the bodies of girls and women. Um, by making things sexual that just are not sexual, like little girls' bodies in general. Shoulders are not inherently sexy. Knees are not inherently sexy. Thighs aren't inherently sexy. The list goes on and on and on. And yet what we're seeing is, is a, a culture, so many cultures that are religious and not religious and schools and institutions that are, are basically breaking girls into parts. Yeah, um... So when in environments where people are trying to prevent girls from looking too sexy and, and trying to prevent girls yeah. from being objectified, unfortunately, sometimes it swings all the way around to the other side. That's where the they ironic are, part. Where mm -hmm. they are right? objectifying girls and women by saying, don't show this, don't show this, don't show this, don't show this, this is appropriate, this is not. Which yeah. is inherently yeah. objectifying. Yeah, they are yeah. sexualizing girls that are not... You know, maybe some of the, of course, all girls and women are taught that their sexuality is the most important thing about them. Yeah, these are, these are well-meaning people who are trying to create these really careful, particular dress codes for schools, for churches, and everywhere else to try to prevent girls from showing up in something, you know, really outlandish or inappropriate. But unfortunately, it is kind of doing the opposite, where it's teaching girls and women to focus even more on their bodies. And so when they show up at the dance in a dress that maybe they thought was was perfect and appropriate and beautiful and their parents just loved and they show up and the the leader at the door or the principal or teacher or whatever says ah, nope I can I can see a little too much knee there or you're showing too much shoulder or I see your cleavage maybe it's a curvier girl who couldn't possibly cover up her cleavage in a dress that would look you know perfectly cleavage free on a thinner girl this stuff happens all the time they get turned away and in that process they're being humiliated often mm. and really objectified by people who are trying to enforce the rules but doing it in a way that's actually pretty subjective. You know, they're really imposing their own opinions on which girls are appropriate and which girls are maybe too tempting for boys. And that is doing a huge disservice to girls especially who should be viewed as people first instead of bodies first. It's so tricky. I mean, you can see where people are coming from yeah. with with dress codes, and sometimes we need some black and white rules yeah. to kind of get to that higher level thinking. Yeah. But but at the same time, uh, there's got to be a, a better way than yeah. you were saying. This reinforces self objectification, but I think it also reinforces objectifying each other. Yes. Right? Where Absolutely. it's like we police each other and we say, "Well, mm -hmm. she got away with that. Why can't I wear this?" Or, "Oh, look at her. She looks like such mm -hmm. a whore." Or whatever. I mean, That's that stuff happens. <laughs> that happens. Mm -hmm. You know, so I I think what I think I read somewhere with you guys saying something along the lines of looking at dressing in a way that helps you yeah. in, as an individual not objectify yeah. yourself. That's how we recommend people reframe this whole idea of dress codes, whether it's the people writing the dress codes, the people enforcing them, and obviously the people who are needing to comply with them. We want people to focus on the girls themselves, how they feel in their clothing, and help those girls make choices for themselves that will allow them to focus on who they are, what they can do, what activity they're engaging in at the mo in the moment and not how their bodies look in that moment which is objectification. And here's a really good example of that that's not sexual, right? So a lot of my clients will be like, "Paige, my pants are so tight and all I do all day long is think about that mm -hmm. and it uh, holds me back from being able to do my work, right? So then it's like and mm -hmm. it's an act of like gentle kindness to yourself to go and buy some pants yes. that fit you. And it's not at all like, oh, I need to buy these to conform to some dress code. It's like I'm doing this to help me not objectify myself right. so oh, much. Yeah. Well research shows us that a level of I'm putting modesty in quotes is very helpful for girls and women, and that is subjective. It changes from culture to culture, from person to person. But if you, let's say you're going to the gym. Right now, what is in for girls and women at the gym is like a sports bra and spandex leggings, you know? Like basically that would be what you see on any celebrity fit model. But if I wore that to the gym, I could not get past how I looked from every angle the entire time I am there. And studies show us that if a girl will, if a girl or woman will modify her dress just a bit so that she isn't fixated on her body and she can get into a flow state, she will perform much better at the gym. So that's such a great way to reframe modesty mm -hmm. or, or dress codes or whatever oh, yeah. rules about dressing. I, and I really, I love that because yeah, like I've, 
I've been in a situation where it's like, I'm really uncomfortable in what I'm wearing. And it's not, it's not a modesty thing. It's just like a, I need to, and I'm worrying about what everyone's thinking. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that they're, they're totally, that's a really cool way to think about how to dress. Like we want to get to a place where we believe our bodies are instruments, not ornaments. We are here to do good in our bodies. We're here to experience joy in our bodies. You cannot experience joy and get outside of yourself if you are fixated on yourself. That is a selfish act. Self-objective Justification keeps you focused inward in a prison, a prison in your own body. We want women out, unlocked from the prison, able to get on to every other more important thing. So sometimes when, okay, it's very trendy to talk about self-love mm-hmm. right now, right? Mm-hmm. And self-care. Those are like two really yeah. buzzy words. Um, and some, uh, here's what's tricky about the idea of what you're just saying with self-objectification and how that's selfish. When someone from that place is hearing, mm-hmm. you need to be aware, you need to think about yourself, you need to um, mm-hmm. love yourself. I think that that can be really confusing for people because yeah. they're like, you're well, right. I do that. Like I think about myself all all day, mm-hmm. you know, but it's, it's such a different thing. Well, so yeah. differentiate women, those. Women have been taught to, um, prioritize themselves and treat yourself in ways that prioritize their appearance more than their actual feelings. And their oh, self-worth. that's so true. Paint your nails, exactly. like, get a facial. You yeah. Know? Think of all the ways that women are taught to self I have never realized that. Yeah. That, um, that's like mind blown right now. Oh, there's so many makeup and skincare campaigns that are all about, um, empower yourself with that new red lipstick. Mm-hmm. There's literally a campaign for empower yourself with lipstick. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a Mandy Moore Clairol commercial on right now that says, changing my hair color changed everything. And so oh there's gosh. all these things that are about how women can take control of their lives and finally feel good and be confident mm-hmm. by changing their appearance. And weight loss is one of those things that women are told that you mm-hmm. are taking care of yourself. You are finally putting yourself first if you will prioritize losing weight. You know, that's one of those things, those cliches. And women need to be really critical of the ways that industries, profit-driven yeah. industries, are telling us to take care of ourselves by spending money on our appearance. We would caution that your self-care should include you getting into a state of flow that is the opposite of being in a self-objectifying state. So when I say state of flow, that's a real thing. It's an idea of you getting outside of your own head to the point that you are lost in a state of consciousness, whether it's writing or running or playing with your kids or painting, whatever it is, whatever it is, get to a state of flow where your self is out of the picture, where you aren't picturing what you look like instead of living. That is the best self-care you could ever practice. And kids are so good at that. Yes. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm in constant amazement at just, like, how easy that is for them. Yeah. And it's, I, I can imagine that a lot of it's because they don't have all the hang-ups yeah. about bodies. It's true. Definitely. Yeah, that's... Like we said earlier, that's where it starts to pick up is in puberty. And girls at that exact same time stop raising their hands in class. Mm -hmm. They stop going up for leadership positions at school and in their communities. They quit PE. They stop exercising and and every other type of physical activity Mm -hmm. because they're concerned about what they look like as their bodies change and as, you know, boys at school are looking at them. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating research. Um, Okay. What else do we need to talk about? Um, Talk about some of the, the... issues that your followers have had and some of the things that maybe someone listening, what can you anticipate that they'll be like, "Mm, that didn't make sense or like, oh, they didn't talk about that in enough detail. I always, Mm -hmm. I always really try to do that in interviews Mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I'm always sensitive that this could be someone's very first exposure to body image or to resilience or Mm -hmm. to, um, self-objectification or even to like, how does this have anything to do with nutrition? You know, like, but maybe we should draw that parallel right here, right now. Like obviously the way we feed ourselves is very much affected by how we feel about our bodies. I can't do the work I do without talking about bodies. Mm -hmm. So this is a really relevant conversation, even in the realm of nutrition, because it gets in the way of us yeah. caring for ourselves well. Definitely. I think the nutrition conversation fits into body image really well. There's so many important um, parallels and crossovers there. And one of them comes into this idea of resilience that we've been discussing. And it's um, what Lexi and I feel really strongly about this idea of body image resilience or being able to go through hard things in this objectifying culture we live in that trigger you to feel shame about your body to, um, to just feel negatively in any way. We all go through those things. No matter what you look like, you could be the most beautiful, beautiful woman in the world and maybe feel 
feeling worse about your body than someone else who I can attest to that. It's true. I have clients who Mm -hmm. will, yeah, people would be shocked. Yeah. Who would, yeah. You'd be shocked about the stuff that is in people's hearts about their bodies. Oh yeah. When people have been, um, validated and defined by their looks for a long time. And when people have always thought that was the prettiest girl in the room, then those women know that. And as they age, as their bodies change, as they get older, um, people, they lose a little bit of that validation that maybe was so consistent for a long time. And that can do it. Or they have to work really hard to keep it up. You know, if you're pretty when you're little, you have to work so hard your entire life to keep it up, to keep getting those compliments. And when you stop getting them for whatever reason, it's really difficult. Right. Okay. Compliments. That's actually a really important topic that I, I wrote an article about this and then I saw you guys like soon after or before or whatever, some timing very close to when I talked about it. And I got so much heat about this article. Like people were so mad that I was saying that maybe we should think about like <laughs> complimenting each other on uh, something else oh, other yeah. than our bodies. Oh, so we have I know you feel, that. I know you feel the same way, but oh, yeah. yeah, let's talk about that. We wrote um, this post called when you look so skinny hurts or does more harm than it does more harm than good we wrote it a few years ago reposted it pretty recently it has been one of our biggest most popular posts by far basically the tenet is i'm sure exactly what you're talking about that um one of the things we talk about is that when you see somebody who has lost weight and you either comment on their instagram photos or you see them in real life and you say oh my gosh you look so skinny i'm so jealous or oh you look so good you know whatever and it doesn't even just have to be about thinness those things reprioritize looks for the person getting the compliment. And all of a sudden, it becomes this thing that is back in their minds. Self-objectification yeah. becomes, like, magnified. Yeah. Yeah. By talking about it. When we're talking about it in terms of weight loss, if you don't know how that person has lost weight, what you're doing when you're complimenting them publicly or via social media is reinforcing that thinness is the most important thing about that person and that whatever extremes it took for them to get there, whether they were sick or doing some extreme dieting, having eating disordered behavior, they were depressed, whatever it is, that was good because it got them to this place where they're thinner. It's the worst thing you can do. Yeah, we've got to be really careful with how we talk to each other, not just for the person receiving the compliment, but for everyone on their page who reads those compliments. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that people don't always understand is that there are many more people viewing that person's photo and the comments that you leave than just that individual. And everyone's comparing themselves to the photos, but also thinking, why don't I get comments like that? And it can really trigger some disordered behaviors in people who are seeking thinness or beauty at the expense of anything else. And it's, I mean, this comes right back to what we've been talking about this whole time. If we define ourselves by our bodies and then we get that social, um, capital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Like Mm -hmm. people like it and people tell you that. Mm -hmm. And then at some point something changes for whatever reason. And now you're not getting the amount of compliments that you were before. And it's like messages loud and clear. Like you liked me more then than now. I have an example of that. I was, um, in December I got the flu and for two weeks I was down and out. I definitely lost weight. I'm sure I did because I didn't feel like I could even eat. You were sick as a dog. Mm -hmm. (laughs) When I went back to work one day, um, a wonderful coworker of mine said, oh my gosh, you look so skinny. You're doing something right. You look great. And I said, oh my goodness, thank you, but no. (laughs) I said this in the nicest way. People always ask, how do you turn that compliment around? I said, thank you so much for saying that, but I've been really sick. I have not felt good. And I promise you, I'm about to gain this weight back. And then you're not going to compliment me. And then I'm going to feel bad. Did you say that? Yeah, I did. Oh yeah. I said it in a funny way. I was like, come on. So I was like, you have to compliment me for something else, something more lasting. And we need to get to the point where we stop saying thank you. When people say you look so skinny, we need to stop, um, adding value to the idea that thinness is better than whatever we were before. I just felt like I had to, I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. of course I could have said, no, don't do it. Don't you put that value on thinness, you know? Well, she thinks she's complimenting you. And so you want to validate that while also being careful to make sure she doesn't do that to other people who are sick. So the thing we, um, ask people to do out of the goodness of their hearts is if you give a looks based compliment, or if you don't, add something else, add a character-based compliment, a trait-based compliment. You can say any number of things. It will be lasting. It will be the kind of thing that if you received the compliment, you would want to write it down because it feels so good. Mm. Tell somebody something like, 
I heard that comment you gave in that lecture. That was so smart. I wrote it down. I'm, I'm so grateful that you were brave enough to raise your hand and make that comment because I really loved it. Or I saw you playing with your kids. You weren't even staring at your phone once. Like it's okay to stare at your phone, <laughs> but you know, something like I saw you just out there playing with your kids, having so much fun swimming with them. I'm going to do that too now because you did that. You know, those kind totally. of things. That was so inspirational yes. or like, yeah, and they last, I, you know, I know this might be a dumb comment. Maybe I'll edit this out, but <laughs> I had a, I had an experience where some guy was hitting on me, which hasn't happened much in my life to be <laughs> honest, but yeah, right. this, no, it's <laughs> seriously. And so I kind of didn't pick up on it, but he kept saying like, you're so beautiful. You're so beautiful. And like over and over again. And like, I, I don't, I couldn't put my finger on it in the moment, like why that bothered me so much. Mm -hmm. But I think like hearing, like, doing this work over the last few years of like getting really into this idea of like body image and feminism and like the systemic things mm -hmm. going on with women. I was like, I realized that's not really what I want anyone. I mean, I, mm -hmm. it's fine. Like, wow, you look really beautiful today. Like, that's a great compliment. I'm okay with that. Yeah, but, sure. mm -hmm. but, and when you can tell it's genuine and comes from the heart, Yeah, definitely. but like, I'd much rather someone say, gosh, that was brilliant what mm -hmm. you did. Or like, mm -hmm. man, your brain, like, I just love the way your brain works. Oh, and I, yeah. I love talking to you or you're such a supportive friend. Like to me, that's like, oh, thank you. Yeah. That's what I value. That's what you I care about. You can't brush those things off as easy as you can. Somebody saying that you look beautiful today, you yeah. know? Yeah. There's so many things you can say. Oh, well, you should have seen me when I woke up this morning. Or yeah, this is under a bunch of makeup. Right. Like yeah. I happened to shower yes. and I happened to put makeup on. Right. Like, what would you say if, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And this kind of leads to this larger point that I think could be an uh, an important point to end on. And it's that we found in our research that that feeling like your life has purpose, like finding meaning beyond numbers, whether it's your lifelong weight loss goals that so many people have, or that you count your macros or your carbs or, you know, the numbers that we focus on, all of these arbitrary measures of success. When we can feel purpose in our lives that often comes because of the painful things we've experienced, we get to someplace so much more powerful. We add something to our lives instead of just always like taking away through restriction, through shrinking, through mm. whatever these kind of objectifying goals are. So we found this a lot in our work in body image resilience. We, um, in our research, this one woman told us that when she was younger, she had been sexually assaulted. And for a long time, that was a thing that she used as a crutch that she just dragged around with her that kept her from caring about herself. She took, she did not take good care of her body because of it, because her body had been used as a weapon against her. She was in unhealthy relationships because she didn't believe that she was worthy of being loved. She said when she got to college, she decided to um, volunteer for an organization that helped girls and women who had been sexually assaulted. And she said, I found my mission. I couldn't have found this mission if I hadn't been through this terrible thing that I wouldn't wish on anyone, but I found purpose in my life. I am so grateful that I can now help girls and women who have been through the same thing. That was one experience of a million where a girl or a woman had experienced something really awful in their bodies, whether it's an eating disorder or an illness or a pregnancy that really threw you for a loop with your body image, whatever the disruption to your body and your relationship to your body is, you can use that hard thing not as a crutch or a stumbling block, but as a literal stepping stone that brings you closer to power, to compassion, to to finding your purpose in your life. And it makes all the difference. And an identity beyond body, mm, yeah. right? Mm. Oh, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Um, so many girls and women, they get their confidence and their identity from their body. And so they have to keep up this lifelong beauty work, we put in quotes. Beauty work, it costs billions of dollars per year for girls and women. When you think about cosmetic surgery, the makeup we use, laser hair removal, every product, every procedure, all the ways we talk about ourselves, the things we're viewing on social media that, you know, the before and after photos that are supposedly keeping us motivated on our workout plans or our diets, all of these things, this is beauty work that girls and women disproportionately do. Can you imagine how that's holding us back? When we find our purpose and our power beyond our bodies, the whole world improves. The lives of boys and men improve because of it. There are so many reasons that every one of us need to find what we're powerful in, what makes us passionate, and do, do, do it. <laughs> oh my goodness, that was so amazing. What would you add, Lindsay? I would say, I think viewers will, or listeners will probably have a question about um, 
how the role of makeup and mm-hmm. cosmetic surgery and um, fashion plays into this because we get asked that constantly. Mm-hmm. People always say, well, I can see that you wear makeup and it looks like you maybe care about your clothes. So uh, so how do you justify that? Mm-hmm. How can you mm-hmm. be a feminist and speak out against objectification um, while still doing those things? And what we say is that it's very important for everyone to take inventory of their own choices, their own time and effort, um, the the sacrifices that they make in the name of beauty and appearance. How much time do you spend focusing on what you look like? How much time do you spend in front of the mirror every day getting ready? Or um, how much money do you spend on makeup and clothes and all that kind of stuff? We all will have a different line for what is appropriate, and that's important that it is different for everyone. Everyone, we would never make a that's proclamation. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. We would never make some proclamation that says, "Now this much makeup is good and this much makeup is bad." Or, that's like that's no yeah. different than the dress code conversation. It, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's true. Yeah, everyone needs to really just kind of be critical of your own choices. We've drawn the line at things that hurt us. We don't do things that hurt us. Mm-hmm. Um, I we both have tried to scale back on things that we used to think were really important for our identities. And one of those things is like having light highlighted blonde hair. Mm -hmm. Um, For a long time in our lives, we both felt like we had to have platinum hair. And so you spend whatever and, you know, and all of that. So I decided that I was going to challenge myself to see if that really needed to be part of my identity. And I took five years off of dyeing or highlighting or doing anything to my hair. And I proved to myself, yeah, that doesn't matter. That's not part of me. And so when people are able to kind of scale back and skip makeup for a day and go out of the house without getting super done up, you can see that you're still you. And it doesn't take away from who you are and um, even how people perceive and treat you. We can all draw the line for ourselves about how much time and energy and effort we put into beauty so that we can see a little bit more than that. When we learn to see more in ourselves, we can see more in other people too. And that allows us to be more. For me, while I would never knock anybody who does laser hair removal as one of the many things that girls and women are begged to do on billboards and radio commercials and everything, I don't want to do it because I have a little girl who is almost two and she's growing hair on her legs, and I want her to know that it's okay to have hair on your legs. So I I shave my legs when I do, you know? <laughs> when it happens. <laughs> when it happens. But I want her to know that, that it's okay to have hair on your legs. Every time we do these things in the name of beauty, we raise the bar for our babies. And then our babies have to do those things in order to just feel normal, in order to just look like what a normal woman looks like. And I always want to be cognizant of that with the people that I see in real life every day. That's so important. Um, and, and, you know, it really relates to kind of how I see nutrition. So it's it's not prescriptive, right? Yes. You're not saying here is what's okay, here's right and wrong. I mean, that's what we're trying to move away from. Right. It's kind of like every person is going to land in their own place that feels right for them about makeup or about um, the way they dress or about, you know, this journey with body image or even how you feed yourself. And that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, and so when we do this thing like, oh, we're, makeup is objectifying, we're kind of missing the point. Yeah. It's kind of like, that's, that's overly simplified. It's kind of like, why do you wear it? Mm -hmm. How often and how much? And how does it make you feel, right? And it's the same exact thing when when we're talking about food. You get into totally. really problematic places when you're like, this is what you should eat and when. Yeah, um, yeah you run into yeah. similar issues. We always ask people to be re- really critical of the ways they're using um, appearance-related things like makeup and clothes and dieting. And food is one of those things as well where people, all of those are good and normal and healthy things that I think most people can have balance of within their lives. But when you are feeling shameful about your appearance, in particular body images at the root of all of these things, then people will use all of those um, things as weapons against themselves and and use those things to cope with shame. And so in this model, um, Lexi and I developed this model of body image resilience. is a theoretical model that takes people through the steps of feeling objectified, feeling shame, um, going through some disruption to your comfort zone relating to your body image. And everyone 
takes a different path out of that in order to cope. And some people will abuse food as a way to cope with the shame they feel about themselves. Um, and some people will turn to cosmetic surgery, disordered eating, um, self-harm, abuse of alcohol, prescription drugs. There's so many different ways that people will um, take things to extremes just to, to feel normal, to feel numb, um, and get through these hard things that we go through. But we all can recognize those things that we're using and when we're hurting ourselves with them by understanding that we are dealing with shame, that we are dealing with things that um, are difficult and particularly difficult for women in a lot of ways when appearance is at the forefront of our thoughts. And when we do identify that we're going down one of those paths that's actually making us feel worse about ourselves and um, making us feel even more shame about our bodies in the end, we can choose to take a different path. And that's the, the glory of this model of body image resilience is there is this third path that takes you rising out of shame. Mm -hmm. And when we are able to acknowledge that we've been going down dark paths, it's the first step to see that there are opportunities to make changes in your life. And we all have access to these strengths and skills and sources of power that can enable us to make better choices with food and with makeup and with our bodies and the ways that we use our bodies and turn those into good, healthy, positive, and empowering things instead of weapons against our own bodies. Whoa. So well said. That's amazing. Do you want to add anything, Lexi? I think that was it. We got it. We got it. Well, just take a minute to talk about how people can find your website and your course and your Instagram and whatever else. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we are at beautyredefined.org and we do a lot with social media on Facebook. You can search us facebook.com slash beauty redefined. On Instagram, we are at beauty underscore redefined. On Twitter, we're at Take Back Beauty, and we offer an online course in body image resilience. It's eight weeks. We started it during our dissertations and tested it then, and that's at courses.beautyredefined.org. Awesome, and I'll link to all of that, too. Thank you. This has been such a pleasure <laughs> to meet you in real life and to sit down with you and to have this conversation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave here a little bit better than I found myself before we, we started too. talking. We will, so, too. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Well, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this conversation. If you haven't already, please go ahead and leave a review on iTunes. Thanks again so much for listening, and we'll see you soon for another episode.